check. Mic check. Let's say that you want a watercolor effect without actually painting on a landscape. In my last tutorial, I covered the Gaku plugin, which is a watercolor-esque plugin. But let's say that you don't want to pay the cost of a plugin. The question that came in was, how can I do this with just nodes? I'm going to show you a method that I found using nodes to make something between a watercolor and old newspaper-esque style that I'm really in love with. And let's just jump right in. First, we're going to start by deleting our default cube, and we're going to do that by hitting X and confirming delete. Then we're going to go to add and add a mesh plane. And we're going to go into edit mode, click command E, and we're going to subdivide our surface by 100. Next, I'm going to go back into object mode and back into edit mode once again, and we're gonna subdivide it by three. And we just want to do this so that we have a very fine mesh. 100 is the limit, and so that's why we go back and do it again. Next, I'm going to go into my modifiers. I'm going to add a displacement surface. So I'm going to add an image and that image is going to be a digital elevation model. And in my last tutorial, I went into depth about digital elevation models, how to find them, what is a good digital elevation model resolution, and how to get a model so that you can optimize for both rendering time and have a really crisp rendering. If you'd like to see that, I'm going to add a link below so that you can learn more about this process in depth. But for now, I'm just going to add it. And I like to do this and scale my extrusion layer by looking at the actual pixel dimensions of the DEM so I can scale it appropriately. And as we can see, the pixel dimensions on this 2,888 pixels by 1,859. And that's gonna give me the proper dimension so that my extrusion matches my original image. So I'm going to adjust the strength of my extrusion by going into my modifiers tab and changing that so that it's still exaggerated, but not so much so. So I've now gone into my global tab and I'm going to edit my global settings so that I have a gray background and you can do that by using the nodes and you're only going to see this background when you are in your rendering mode which you can do by clicking the fourth sphere to the top and I'm going to adjust my lighting and I want it to be sunlight so that I can have a really high contrast so I'm also going to move my sunlight up and over and then decrease that strength to 10. If you haven't noticed, there's a new career on the rise, and that is being an information designer, which is the intersection of UX, graphic design, and data visualization. And the reason why it's so sought after at this point is with all the AI tools that are available and informational resources, so many people can be so many different things. And so to be able to merge these things and meld them in an artful way is something that companies are looking for. For the last three years, I've been talking to CEOs of software companies that are making these types of informational design tools, and I want to share them with you. In the description below, there's a link that will give you the opportunity to reserve a seat for this upcoming course material. If you sign up early, you are eligible for a 50% off founder's discount, and you also get a really great say in what goes into this course so that you can be best equipped in this age of AI. And now we're going to resume with the video. I'm going to need an image and I love to use Google Earth Studio. In case you've never been exposed to Google Earth Studio, Google Earth Studio is a render engine. You can make a animation out of aerial imagery. I'll include a link at the bottom so that you can sign up for Google Earth Studio. It's really incredible. When you're rendering it, you can change the settings so that you can have an ideal resolution. And I'm changing my resolution from a standard digital format 
to make it high definition. Then I'm gonna actually change my dimensions to fit the dimensions of my image. And that's gonna make it so that this is a bit of an easier overlay. I'm going to save this render onto my desktop. All right, I'm going to open my image, which has been saved as footage. And as we can see, it's pretty high resolution and it doesn't need to be perfect because in the end I'm making a bit of an abstraction from this photo, but you can get higher if you'd like. I'm going to make a new material and to do that, I'm going to simply go into my shading editor and click new. Next, I'm going to add an image texture and I'm going to navigate to my image by clicking open and then clicking on my footage, grabbing that image, and then I'm going to connect it to my base color. And we can see here automatically that when it's connected, it's off kilter. The coordinate systems are slightly off and it is not aligned with my extrusion. So I'm going to do this by going into UV editing. And I haven't made this into an absolute science. So if somebody has a better way of doing this, I would love your feedback. But you're going to be moving this around to just adjust to that layer by just switching in and out of object mode. I'm going to show you this tutorial called UV Unwrapping for Beginners. Shout out to Ryan King Art. Go check out some of his tutorials. They're awesome if you're a beginner at Blender. You can see that when you're doing a normal surface, you're normally going to see all of those panels. We have three hundred subdivisions and that means that we're going to have to read between the lines as it were and just kind of push and pull that until it's just about right the other thing to note is that what we're using is a modified surface model therefore it's not exactly a 3d object it's a 3d extrusion which behaves differently in blender and so i don't see it in editing mode because it's a modifier. So for that reason, we have to eyeball it. I'm pleased with the placement of our mesh. Now we're going to clean this up and make sure that we just have the surface area that we need by going into editing mode. And we're going to drag our cursor over the faces that we want to delete. Make sure that our faces are being selected and not just the points or lines, which you can do by clicking on the left panel the third option, and I'm going to simply click X, delete, and now we have a cleaner surface to get working on our texture. I'm going to add a noise texture and hook that up in between my BDSF and my image texture. We're gonna add a mapping node and then shader to RGB and connect our principal BDSF, shader to RGB, and connect the color to our mapping node. Now we're going to copy and paste our image texture and put it over to the side while we get a color ramp. And we're gonna connect the color ramp to our mapping node. And then it's gonna be very slight, the difference that you're gonna see, but the mapping node is now shading this according to the color ramp. So we're gonna add a mix color node now Connect this mix node to our other color ramp and connect the mix node to our material output. And we can see that we have a pretty light texture right now. We're going to adjust this color ramp to change that shadow color. Change the mapping type from point to texture. And then we're going to copy and paste that and connect that to our mapping node. And by connecting this to the mapping location, we're actually going to change the contrast. And we can see that when we toggle it. Change the noise node from 3D to 4D. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like when I control the W factor on our noise texture. It changes that density. I'm satisfied with mine being at 28 and I'm just going to keep it there. You're welcome to change it. And I'm going to show you what it looks like when we start to adjust the color ramp. And we're changing those mid-range colors as you can see. So I'm just going to be toggling and adding a couple different grades to my color ramp in order to add some greater variety in our colors and add to our green spaces. When we start to adjust the scale on our mapping node and adjust the X, Y, or Z coordinates, then we start to get some differentiation in the coloration of our landscape 
and our ocean. And I'm going to toggle this other color ramp to show you what it looks like to get some greater differentiation. And that just takes some playing around with. I've sped up my coloring process, but I wanted to include it so that you could see the process of toggling this color ramp so that I can get that variation that I want. And now that I've done that micro editing on the color ramp, we're just going to name the material and I just named it SF watercolor. So what I love about this final product is that we get some of that real aerial imagery integrated with a watercolor effect. We're still getting those green zones like the park and Mount Sutro while also abstracting some of these details so that it doesn't have to be a perfect overlay. It's a pretty artistic take on what San Francisco actually looks like, so I'm excited to use this as a base map for a larger analysis. In my next tutorial, I'm going to cover how to do a digital elevation model and map it according to the elevation. This is a really great effect if you're working on a larger landscape, so stay tuned for that, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to watch more of this content and learn more about information design and how to turn real data into to compelling designs.